Hello, everyone from wherever you're joining. Thank you for being here today for this NCAR Explorer Series conversation, understanding how we see our sun's atmosphere with Dr. Anna Malnushenko. My name is Dr. Dan Zietlow, and I'm an educational designer here at the National Center for Atmospheric Research, or NCAR, which is a world leading organization dedicated to understanding Earth system science. So that includes our atmosphere, weather, climate, our sun, and how all of these systems interact and impact society. I'm really glad that y'all could be with us today to learn more about some new results that may lead us to rethink how we measure and understand the atmosphere of our sun. For this event, you'll be able to ask Dr. Malinushenko questions throughout the conversation using the Slido platform. If you scroll down this webpage, you can see the Slido window just below where you are seeing the live stream of video of this event. And if you haven't already, go ahead and click on that green join event button, and then you can ask questions on the Q&A tab and answer poll questions on the polls tab, both of which are found in that blue bar across the top. And definitely be sure to join Slido to add your thoughts to our work cloud question. What do you think of when you hear the atmosphere of our sun? Because we're going to be getting to that very soon. This lecture is also being recorded and will be available on the NCAR Explorer Series website. With us today, we have NCAR scientist, Dr. Anna Malnushenko from the NCAR's High Altitude Observatory, or HAO. She received her PhD in solar physics from Montana State University in 2010, after which she completed two postdocs, one at the Lockheed Martin Solar and Astrophysics Lab, and then another here at NCAR. Annie's research focuses on the magnetic field in the solar atmosphere. She's also a lead of a science working group focused on interplanetary coronal mass ejections in PUNCH, which is an upcoming NASA mission for understanding how the mass and energy of the solar corona transform into solar wind. And so Annie, can you turn on your camera and give us a quick hello before we check out our work cloud question? Hello. Awesome. Uh, so Paul and Brett, uh, would you be able to share Slido for us so we can see uh, what our uh, audience is thinking about our work cloud? Great, so some of the, the things that I'm seeing right now, um, so hot storms, really, really hot, gas, hot. So I'm getting a sense of uh, maybe a very high temperature in our solar atmosphere, um, chaotic, solar flares. Uh, so Annie, how, um, uh, what do you think about some of those results from our audience? Uh, they are all great. I'm loving all of them, and I'm thrilled that the audience has has those associations. They are all absolutely correct. I would like to point out that when you combine the word gas with the word really, really hot, you get a new word called plasma. Uh, but uh, other than that, uh, CME solar flares are all, all uh, you can think of them as storms, and they mm -hmm. take place in the solar atmosphere, which is indeed really, really hot. It's a gas, so how it is magnetized. Awesome, and then I also see a few folks just added CMEs of coronal mass ejections. Yep. Uh, great, so let's go ahead and dive into our conversation. So, so Annie, uh, you work in the High Altitude Observatory here at NCAR. Uh, so can you tell us you know, what, what is HAO? What research topics is, is the lab interested in? And, and what is your role? Oh, thank you. So HAO uh, has, um, um, HEO studies um, works on a range of topics basically in uh, sun earth system science, and they span from the solar to heliosphere to some of the impact of space weather on earth. So in the sun, we do study uh, topics like long-term solar, solar variability and coronal mass ejection, initiation and eruption and magnetic field and active regions. Uh, in the interplanetary space, we do study the propagation of coronal mass ejections. And uh, we, uh, in the, uh, in the uh, impact on the Earth sort of areas, uh, we study the impact of solar energetic particles on the upper atmosphere. And uh, we study the Earth's magnetic tail and uh, the coupling with the the atmosphere coupling uh, with the mesosphere and yeah and all those topics uh, are a, a lot a lot of it is theory but we also do have some observational facilities uh, such as Mauna Loa's solar observatory and there are some eclipse expeditions and uh, there are some uh, Fabry Perron uh, interferometers that study the ionosphere and the upper atmosphere and also uh, well, last but not least, uh, we have the educational department 
so and outreach so uh, i guess that's about it and as for my role in it i am a project scientist and i work mostly in the solar and heliospheric areas and i study in the solar in the solar areas i study the magnetic field in the uh, in the solar atmosphere or corona you will hear the word corona a lot uh, in this conversation um, and uh, in the uh, heliosphere, I study the propagation of uh, interplanetary uh, coronal mass ejections, and uh, I am a leader of uh, a working group of uh, upcoming hot NASA mission called Punch. Wow, so it sounds like there's a ton going on in HAO and even within your own research. So I have a follow-up question. Before, before we get to that, I just want to remind the audience, we actually have uh, some poll questions for, for y'all to respond to, and we're about to come up to one very soon. It's the first time we've ever done an open response uh, poll question, so we'll see how this works out. Uh, but we'd love to hear from, from you about if you were uh, promoted to a scientist today, what would you study about the sun? Um, but before we get to that, uh, Annie, so how did you become interested in kind of being a solar physicist and doing some of the work that you do? Well, uh, from an early age, I knew I wanted to be a scientist. Uh, and the reason simply being is that my both of my parents are scientists. And I just saw how much fun they have at their, at their work. And I, and I wanted to have as much fun. And uh, I eventually converged into the physics uh, area because uh, I, like, I like to understand how the world is made. And physics is a well, naturally interesting area. And there are a lot of fun puzzles uh, in the um, uh, in physics in general. And I mean, I guess I guess in research in general, I'm speaking about physics because this is what I know most. You would think that scientists, or at least that's the popular opinion, you know, scientists are those, you know, nerdy people, you know, with eyeglasses and you know, really boring, know a lot, I do some boring stuff, super smart. Uh, well, the truth is that uh, uh, science is solving fun puzzles. And I did get into the solar puzzles and solar area of research in particular through a program called Research Experience for Undergraduates. And uh, this is something that is uh, common around uh, United States and that is an excellent opportunity to, well, so to speak, try before you buy, try different, uh, areas of scientific research over the summer holidays and see if you like them and well your time is paid so that is also pleasant for an undergrad student so i tried solar physics and i liked it a lot uh on top of fun puzzles that uh, like i said i like to solve uh there are a lot of stunning visuals there's a lot of good physics and you know i, I just figured that a lot of this research is you know i get to program video games and then i get to play them so that was cool. That was so cool that I tried again uh, the next summer and again and again. And uh, here I am now studying the sun full time. Awesome, thanks for sharing that. Yeah, it's, I mean, I, I agree with you. There's, there's lots of kind of fun questions that we can ask as, as scientists. And there's, there's also lots of great ways to get involved even from a pretty early age. Um, so moving into maybe thinking about you know, how, how can we actually study the sun? Uh, Paul and Brett, let's maybe pull up that, that first poll question about um, if, our, if our audience was promoted to a scientist today, given that we can't look directly at the sun, um, what, what would you want to study about the sun? And so looking at some of our answers, I'm seeing energy readings, uh, use a sensor like a camera with a filter and then look at the output of the camera, um, satellites, images of the sun, coronagraphs, photographs, uh, carefully, I like that one. Um, what controls the solar cycle? Satellite data. Uh, a, a new one just came in. I'm not totally sure. I guess using basic laws of physics and studying the things the sun affects and changes in research and theory. <laughs> so, <laughs> any of those stand out to you, Annie? <laughs> Absolutely, all of them, uh, including the word carefully. <laughs> yeah, I, I, I like that one too, especially with the, the sunglass emoji afterward. <laughs> um, Cool. So since, you know, speaking of carefully, you know, since the sun is so bright and it's not safe for humans to look directly at the sun, so please never look directly at the sun. Um, you know, how, how do scientists do this? Like, how, how do we study the sun? Uh, well, there are different ways to do that. Uh, and, uh, well, and those ways, they, uh, largely speaking, uh, they split into two different 
um, approaches. One approach is observations. The second approach is models. And speaking of observations, uh, yes, yes to telescopes. And telescopes are nothing more than a gigantic photo, uh, photo cameras and video cameras uh, with a lot of bits and pieces attached to them. And a lot of the telescopes are based on Earth. Uh, however, uh, there are a lot of telescopes these days that are orbiting the Earth or even orbiting the Sun or are even based on other planets. Uh, in fact, I have a picture here that I wanted to share, Great. and it is also available on um, NASA website, uh, and that is um, share screen. And I am sharing my very browser so you can see the web page science that nasa.gov, so you can go there and see for yourself. But this is this is basically a fleet of the uh, heliophysics uh, observatories that are currently in space or in development. Now, why do we need to go to space? Well, <laughs> uh, we all know about the importance of sunscreen, right? So that we don't uh, get burned, so that our skin doesn't get burned with ultraviolet and ultraviolet comes from the sun. So you would think that, okay, if uh, a lot of interesting things on the sun are visible in ultraviolet, we, can, we, should, we should be able to study it from, from Earth, right? Well, the truth is that uh, it is the solar disk that um, that is bright enough to burn our skin even, even even through the atmosphere. However, if we obscure the solar disk and get a coronagraph uh, to study the atmosphere of the sun or the corona, it turns out that uh, it is so faint and Earth atmosphere is so thick that it blocks a lot of good information. Uh, this is why to study the corona we need to get beyond Earth atmosphere. And uh, that is uh, as far as uh, that is as far as the observations. Uh, now, regarding models, it's a philosophically very, very different approach. And here is how it works. So suppose that uh, you see me right now, right? And uh, you see this little ball. Uh, it's actually a cat's toy, and um, they um, uh, allowed me to use it for a demonstration. But suppose I drop this ball. And I mean, most of the audience have access to balls like this and you can drop it and study it for yourself. However, imagine that you were an alien and you lived on a different planet with different atmosphere and you know you have tentacles for arms and you know you don't, you don't have balls. You, you don't have balls like this that drop like this. So what do you do to study this? And you're so far away that you cannot ask me for this ball. So how do you, how do you study how the ball falls? Well, you make a physical model and here's how. Uh, you say, well, uh, we know that there's gravity on Earth, uh, and we know that she is subject to such and such gravity, and the ball is the ball weights such and such, and here is the diameter of the ball, and and how about we put all this into a computer? R remember, I mentioned uh, programming a video game and then getting to play it for yourself. That's it. That's models. So uh, putting all of this into the computer and just put a lot of physical laws into the computer and just make it a model. And uh, the good part about this model is that uh, it allows us an access for something that we cannot directly observe, such as uh, what happens to the ball beyond the screen. I mean, it, it falls into my palm, but you cannot see that. But with the model, you might be able to guess that. Uh, the disadvantage of the models, of course, is that they show you only as much as you put in them. So you have to have a pretty good idea about physics to begin with uh, before you even start modeling. So those are two very different approaches to studying the sun. Great, yeah, as, a, as an undergrad, there was always a healthy competition, I feel like, between the, the observationalists and the, the theorists, uh, at least in my physics lab. Um, and also just a quick note for, for folks in our virtual audience, uh, some of the websites uh, that, that Ani is gonna be showing us throughout this talk are, are available in Slido. So if you click on those three horizontal bars in the upper left-hand corner, if you click on that hamburger drop-down menu, you'll be able to see uh, some of the, the websites that we're, that we're talking about. Cool, so moving into uh, another audience poll question uh, that we had. Um, so speaking of some of these telescopes you had mentioned, both terrestrial and, and then up in our atmosphere, um, we were interested in asking our audience, you know, like what data do we collect or use to study uh, the sun? And this was a poll question that you could uh, choose multiple answers for. And it looks like the, the top um, uh, answer was photographs of the sun. 
followed by properties of interplanetary plasma and magnetic field near Earth. The third was looking at ice at Earth's poles. Uh, number four came in at studying tree rings. And the last one was monitoring social media. Um, so, so Annie, uh, which, which of these are we uh, able to currently collect data on in order to help study the sun? Uh, well, uh, all uh, the top four, uh, however, I must say, I mean, uh, while well, the sun doesn't have its own direct representation in social media, so we cannot collect the data uh, this way, but uh, there are several very good uh, social media outlets for NASA heliophysics and for solar, uh, solar physics in general. Uh, having said that, uh, what scientists do, they take photographs of the sun in different uh, wavelengths of light, and also by combining different wavelengths of light, uh, we can get information like magnetic field, for example, on the solar surface or velocity on the solar surface. And again, I file it under photographs because this is what in essence it is. Uh, then uh, the second topic is properties of interplanetary plasma and magnetic field near Earth. It is a mouthful, but uh, what in essence it is, Imagine a little box that does absolutely nothing but sits on Earth's orbit, measures the magnetic field, and sends the information back to, uh, back to, back to well, our facilities, or measures the density of whatever is coming through it, or the velocity, uh, things like that. And um, it is not as detailed as the photograph, but it is not far away. It, it, is, it is measuring things that came from the sun, and it is measuring them directly. So it has its uses. and yeah and it is used a lot now uh looking at ice at earth poles and studying tree rings is uh well those are three questions and they are correct actually so scientists uh use uh, uh scientists use um uh, well carbon carbon uh, carbon dating methods uh to study long-term solar variability so long that you know before before we had before we before even we even thought how to look at the sun with a telescope, before before we were even humans, so uh, those those two methods are very good uh, ways to get historic data. And uh, scientists aside, uh, we scientists love to post some of our results on social media. So, I mean, even though it was intended to be a wrong question, it is uh, not wrong for public outreach in terms of. Awesome, so I'm gonna pause here because I see that we did have one question come in from, from our audience. Um, so someone in our, in our work cloud had, had mentioned CMEs. And so Jenna is asking, what, what exactly is a coronal mass ejection? Coronal mass ejection, it's a ball of plasma that is accelerated. First I will say it and then I will elaborate. So uh, it, it is a blow of plasma uh, that is erupted from the sun and it is flying away from the sun. And as for how it is uh, erupted, now here, uh, the, good, the question is, I'm, I'm, I'm just looking to see if I have any, any hair bands with me. And apparently I do not. So you will have to use your imagination or, wait, I have a couple of ropes here. Well, from my blinds. I'm just looking for something to create an impromptu demonstration. And, um, do not have it. So uh, here's the thing. So magnetic field lines in the sun, specifically in the solar atmosphere, uh, you will not be wrong if you will think of them as of rubber bands. Uh, there is matter in those rubber bands and what they want to be, they want to be straight and they want to be far apart. So here's one rubber band. We're gonna have to imagine that this is a rubber band uh, and I apologize for that. Uh, and here's a second rubber band. Uh, both of them want to be straight. Uh, they do not want to cross. They do not like to cross. However, um, and, and, and this, by the way, is a model. It's, it's a very, very simple model, but a model, and it has its own limitations. So if we cross them, and, and if we continue pressing on them, so now I twisted them just like that. I did not know if it makes sense. I twisted them just like that. Now, if I keep pressing on them, these ropes will break and the analogy actually will, will break too because what will happen, magnetic reconnection will happen. And all of a sudden, this part uh, will, be, uh, will become connected to this part and this part will become connected to that part. 
and they become they will become disconnected in the middle. And what will happen then is something like a slingshot. So slingshot. Uh, how, do, how do you make a slingshot? Okay, there we go. And imagine that there is a matter loaded right up here. It has been released and it's just flying away from the sun. Sometimes it hits Earth, sometimes it doesn't. But when it hits Earth, there can be consequences. And uh, yeah, don't know if that lengthy explanation made sense. Yeah, that was great. Um, and, we'll, and we'll also talk about some of those uh, maybe societal impacts a little bit later in our conversation too. So, so thinking about our sun, you know, I remember when I was in school and I remember learning about, you know, the solar loop. So, you know, like, like you said, this plasma that's kind of, you know, arching off the, the surface of the sun. So can you talk to us a little bit about kind of our current understanding of the structure of the sun's atmosphere? Uh, you know, so like what's the solar corona and what are what are solar loops? Yeah, I would love to. I mean, I could talk all day about it. Uh, <laughs> can I share my screen, please, right now? And again, I'm sharing I'm sharing a web page uh, with the data with the recent and not so recent data from the sun about uh, from the atmospheric imaging assembly on board the Solar Dynamics Observatory. Uh, and um, you can see uh, the sun yesterday. This, this is what you were to see if you would look at the sun uh, with a very, very, very strong filter, with a very, very strong filter. So, so strong that it's safe for you, so strong that it's safe for your equipment. You will see a few sunspots, boring. But uh, if you were to look at the sun in ultraviolet, such as in 171 angstrom, going to click at 4K here, the same very area will suddenly be a lot less boring. And in fact, what's beneath the surface of the sun will be will appear dark, and you will see those bright features on the surface of the sun. And, and there is magnetic field that comes into the game. I will show a few slides right now, uh, and uh, hopefully that will help explain it. So. Uh, this is the solar corona that I showed you before. By the way, I have a cool picture of the solar corona with the Earth to scale. So this is the sun, and this is the Earth to scale, and this is what corona loops are like to scale. And by the way, they all appear in different colors. I'm switching between different colors. This is this is yellow, and you know this is blue with yellow. And the truth is that those those are false colors. The correct color is extreme ultraviolet. It's beyond our visible range. So what happens is that we get a black and white photograph in this extreme ultraviolet wavelength. And then we just put false colors on it for you know aesthetical purposes or to make uh, some features more visible. So uh, if we look at the solar corona, and if we look at those interesting regions, uh, also called uh, uh, active regions, uh, we will see those coronal loops, which are thin, long, bright arches. And the idea is that they are hot plasma confined to what we call a magnetic flux tubes. And uh, here is uh, what I mean by that. If uh, so, I did I did mention before that by combining several several close wavelengths of light, uh, we can we can get an image of a magnetic field on the sun. And uh, this is this is what it looks like for the same very day. Um, and this is the magnetic field in the same very area uh, as of yesterday. And uh, you can see that there are black and white regions and you can see, well, a little, a little, not very well here, but you can see that those uh, loops, those arches connect, uh, connect black and white areas on the solar surface. So, those are the areas where magnetic field is directed towards us or uh, away from us. So uh, here is the idea. The solar atmosphere is so hot uh, that the electrons are stripped off of atoms and the plasma becomes a magnetized gas. And once it becomes magnetized, it becomes deeply entangled with the magnetic field. And there is magnetic field in the solar atmosphere and we cannot directly observe it, not easily and not very well. well Sometimes we can, but uh, generally, generally what we see is the surface. Uh, but based on the surface, we can make some models, magnetic field lines. Uh, and uh, the plasma is, uh, well, if we do compare 
the coronal loops uh, with the lines of magnetic field, we see a striking resemblance of the two. And this is kind of uh, what, what allowed us to theorize that, you know, there are those things called magnetic flux tubes. And a lot of our physics supports this. We do know that plasma is what we call frozen in, which that is to say, if there is something, if there is something between two magnetic field lines, whatever happens to this something, generally, it will try and remain between those two magnetic uh, field lines forever. So uh, those coronal loops, uh, here's, uh, here's, a, here's a paradigm. Something happens uh, and um, the, plasma, the plasma becomes bright uh, in a particular uh, wavelength of light when it's either very dense or it's heated to just the right temperature or preferably both. So imagine that something right over here where my cursor is had heated this uh, had heated the plasma to just the right temperature and it became very dense or something. Uh, so a little explosion had happened. And the, uh, the topic of the coronal heating is still a very active topic of research. So what happens then is that the plasma will want to move about, it will become a hot gas, it will want to expand, it will, it will want to move, up, move about, but it can only move about between, between the magnetic field lines that it was confined to in the first place. So a good analogy is if you have a field and if you dug two trenches in the field, and if you filled one of them with water, the water will want to flow along one trench, but it will not want to go to the neighboring trench. Uh, and this is a, this is our understanding about how plasma operates in general when it's heated to those temperatures, when it's in, in those conditions. And now we see those loops and it's a no brainer. So we think, well, there are those compact heating events and those compact heating events heat those kind of garden hose like structures. Mm -hmm. And yeah, and those garden hose like structures uh, are denser or just uh, or hotter or just the right temperature than their surrounding. And so they stand out and we see them. And those are called coronal loops. And the, the set of magnetic field lines about one such heating event, a tube like, uh, well, well, it kind of forms a tube like volume. And uh, we tend to refer to it as to a magnetic flux tube. Awesome, and we actually had a question come in, uh, somewhat related. So you were um, kind of talking about the, you know, the outer, outer layer of, of, of our sun, the solar, the solar atmosphere. So Jed is wondering, if the sun is a gas, what then does it mean to have a solar surface? Oh my God, that is a very good question. So, uh, <laughs> well. Uh, initially, we saw those images of the sun, like like, like the ones I showed you earlier. And we saw that the sun is a blob of something. The sun is a blob of something and there is nothing around it. Uh, however, the sun is, well, on, on the other hand, the sun is a gas all the way through, right? So what does it mean that it has a surface? Well, the sun has a surface in the same sense that earth has a surface. Imagine yourself standing on the ground on the lawn. Uh, it's not like uh, it's not like uh, the ground is the divide between something, the, the ground and nothing. That is not true. Uh, the the ground that you're standing on is a divide between the matter that is very very dense, such as soil, and the matter that is a lot less dense, such as air. And it just so happens that if you if you make a plot of the density versus distance from the Earth's uh, center you will see that where exactly where the ground is, there is a drop from, there is a drop in density from extremely high density to extremely low density. Uh, and uh, well, which is from extremely dense uh, soil to low dense air. It turns out that exactly the same thing is happening in the sun. So if we are to look at the plot of density of the sun uh, versus uh, distance from the solar uh, center, we will see an extremely sharp drop precisely where the solar surface is. And uh, which is why we call it solar surface. So stuff below the solar surface is a lot more dense, stuff above solar surface is a lot less dense. Now, uh, the interesting part is, and of course uh, it is plasma above the surface and it's plasma below the surface and it is a magnetized gas above and below the surface. And as such, it is frozen in, in a way that I just explained to you, but, 
the difference in density leads to the difference in physical regimes. So uh, in both in both in both above and below the surface, uh, the plasma is very tightly connected to magnetic field lines. However, uh, below the surface, uh, the plasma does whatever it wants to do. It floats around. It's uh, it is turbulent. There's there's convection, and magnetic field lines have to follow the, the path of the plasma because of the frozen in conditions. Now, above the surface, there there is so little plasma that it has no say. Magnetic field does whatever it wants generally, and plasma has to follow. Uh, okay, I, th I think I understand that. Um, yeah, that, that's interesting. Like, you, you know, what <laughs> what does it mean for something that's not solid to have a solid surface? Um, yeah. So thanks for that. Thanks for that explanation. Um, so moving maybe into some of the work that you've recently been doing. Um, you know, it's it, it's maybe helping us rethink a little bit how we might understand the, the atmosphere of the, of the sun. So could, could you walk us through that work? Yeah, so I, I, I would love to. So uh, I, will, I, will, I will first want to say that I was, I was always interested in the 3D structure of loops ever since I was a grad student. I'm going to share my screen again. Note how coronal loops overlap on this image. And the, the reason why uh, is, I mean, uh, the sun is not flat. The sun, the sun is like a ball, right? The, the sun is a three-dimensional structure, but it, it is a photograph that is flat. So if I can make a cutting edge styrofoam uh, and wire model, uh, and if I can cast a shadow on the backdrop on this model, this shadow is well in, in some in, in some ways analogous to what we see on the image on the left. So 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 so, so what we see is the um, solar corona is what we, is what we say optically thin in the sense that we can see right through it. And when we see right through it, different structures along our line of sight overlap. So uh, I actually actually brought this model right over here. Yeah. It had been buttered by several cats, but it is it is still alive. <laughs> Uh, I've been always interested in the 3D structure. So if what we see is the shadow on the backdrop, the integral along the line of sight, it is the integrant that is very, very interesting. And I must say that it is the integrant that we need to, under, uh, to understand to be able to understand the solar atmosphere. Uh, so I've been always interested in how to determine this integrant and what, what is the shape of the magnetic flux tubes. And for example, in our paper uh, before this work, uh, we looked at how, um, how magnetic flux tubes uh, expand as uh, with a distance away from the sun. So imagine that those are two, two different poles of a bar magnet and you know magnetic field lines spread apart. And what does it mean for the magnetic flux tubes? And uh, we theorize that depending on different configurations at, uh, uh, of the as magnetic field at the surface of the sun, the magnetic flux tubes will have different cross-sectional properties uh, in the solar atmosphere. But of course, this is, this is just a simple model. We don't know how they really are in the sun. Uh, what, what, what we want to know is how they are on the image on the left. And we cannot uh, go there directly, not just yet. Although a recent uh, Parker Solar Probe mission is getting very, very close, but it's not getting close enough, which is which is where models come into the game. And um, before before my work, there was there was a wonderful model of the solar atmosphere um, made by our own, well, the, the code was developed at NCAR, and, and, and there's a difference between a code and a numerical model. So a code is like a potter's wheel, and you can use the potter's wheel to make a beautiful pot, which is uh, a beautiful model of something. So uh, there was a code that contained a lot, of, a lot of the known physics of the sun that went a little bit below the surface and uh, somewhat above the surface. Uh, and um, it, uh, it was developed in NCAR, at HEO, in fact, and later on, a group of scientists led by Lockheed Martin uh, had used that code to. I'm, I'm going to. I'm, I'm going to show you another uh, web page. Uh, use this code to model a solar flare, 
And this is a video from an NCAR news release on the simulation. I will say simulation, and, and by that I mean this box, uh, this, this little active region in a, in a box. And uh, the good part about this model is that we can look inside of it. So for me, it was it was like a gift. It was it was it was a you know a little piece of the sun that was gift wrapped and you know I, given to me, and I could study it. So uh, it it looks just like the sun. Uh, the flare the flare looks very very reasonable, and uh, you know what the the model itself. Uh, the solar atmosphere looked very, very reasonable. Now I'm going to show a very boring slide about this model. And this is a nitty gritty nerdy details. And I don't want you to read all of it. I just wanted to show basically the box. And the box went a, a little bit above the sun, uh, a little bit above the surface, a little bit below the surface. Uh, and uh, a lot of it was nice and as correct as we can only be. And uh, it featured a flare, and a lot of a lot of properties of this flare were correct. So if you remember this analogy about uh, with the ball, the model uh, contained the right time that the ball took to fall down, uh, and the model contained the right color of the ball. The model the model was just as squishy as the ball. Uh, to make an analogy, so it was a good model. And then we looked at it, and it contained uh, good, realistic, believable coronal loops. So in those images. Uh, panel E is the model, and all other panels are actual real solar active regions. And it is hard to tell them apart. Well, a trained eye can if you know what to look for, but I mean, in general, this model was very, very, very reasonable. And by the way, here's the same model view from the side. Again, panel E is the model, and all other panels are actual real observations. So uh, my next step was, to be honest, I was initially interested and continuing this work in finding those coronal loops in 3D and looking at uh, their shape in cross-section. So uh, how do we do this? Uh, again, I did show you the slide before. Uh, just remember, uh, this, uh, the integral along the line of sight is this. Uh, how do we study the integrant? So uh, this, this is part of the model. Uh, suppose that we take a slice through the middle. And suppose that it, we extract, so, so this is a numerical simulation. So it's a cube that has this many pixels in each direction. So how about we extract the middle slice of pixels and look at it and look at, at, it, at the emission of this mid, middle slice uh, face on and see what we, what we will see. So uh, the image on the left shows a lot of coronal loops and we know that coronal loops are magnetic flux tubes uh, that are filled with emitting plasma. So that was kind of the expectation. And I just wanted to study the properties, the cross-sectional properties of those circles. And that was an expectation. This is what I saw. And to be honest, my first reaction was, what? But uh, it, it was immediately clear that we need to understand this further. So I made, I made this uh, movie to look at different slices in the volume of, um, to understand what's inside of it. And do you, do you remember me saying that uh, solar physics is like uh, writing your own video game and then getting to play it? Well, it was a lot of fun making this video actually. And yeah, uh, the, the, the very bottom panel, the black and white picture is, is what we call a magnetogram, is the magnetic field on the surface of the sun. White is pointing up, uh, black is pointing down. There are some magnetic field lines just to guide your vision. Uh, the backdrop uh, shows the line of sight integral, so analogous to the shadow on the backdrop. And then this, this moving plane is, is what we are interested in. The slice in the volume. And there are several things that uh, I noticed here that, that immediately warranted, uh, warranted more stud uh, further study. So uh, how do I... How do I pause oh, right over here, for example? Uh, yeah, so uh, one part of doing research is describing your experience. And here's me describing my experience. On the backdrop, I see thin, long coronal loops. Uh, in the volume, what I see is a veil-like structure with wrinkles, folds, and a very, very complicated uh, shape. And 
we did some further analysis and we found that it is where those wrinkles co-align with the line of sight that we see kernel loops. And uh, that was um, that was actually uh, that allowed us to understand what what on earth is going on here or on the sun what on the sun is going on here. So uh, this this is part of the simulation. So this this little bit a uh, bit bit on the left is actually this little coronal loop that was straightened out. And this is this volume that produced this coronal loop uh, viewed from other from different angles. And you can see a whole lot more coronal loops there and they merge, blend into one another. And the situation looks very, very complicated. Uh, or we can, we can rotate it in a different way. And uh, here's, here's the footprint of it. Do you see this little, this little structure here that looks like a lightning symbol or like an archaic Greek letter, Coppa? So, uh, here, here's the thing. Imagine, imagine that we're looking at it. Imagine there are two different observers that are looking at it from two different ways. Observer one will see two loops where those two bright, um, bright pieces of the veil co-align with our line of sight. Observer, uh, well, and some background in between them. Uh, this, this, this middle part will be less bright because uh, we're looking through it in, um, in in a smaller depth, so to speak. Observer two, uh, we look at this middle part edge on, and it will look at those two legs face on. So observer two will see one loop and background around. And, 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 and this is what that loop was. And well, what happens if we subtract the background, then it will be that the two observers, you would think that we can do stereoscopically look at, look at it from two different directions. But uh, the truth is that if we subtract background, which is uh, a common technique, then we will be looking at two different portions of a coronal loop even. So, so, th so this in essence uh, uh, is what the work is about. And it turns out that uh, if we have a lot of features, this was just one feature and I walked you through it. If you have a lot of fe features, the situation becomes a whole lot more complicated. And uh, you know, it changes a lot about how we, how we study those features because we do we do study, for example, how bright they are as a function of their height, and from that we can study how density drops with height, and the solar atmosphere becomes more rarefied with height, just like Earth's atmosphere, and uh, we can study it. And from 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 how much dimmer they become with height, we can we can figure out how how dense the solar atmosphere, how how quickly it becomes rarefied, rarefied with height. Now, if what we're looking at uh, at are wrinkles in a veil curtain, then we can no longer do this, or we need to do this in a different way. So this is this is what the work is about, and well, the term of the work is uh, coronal veil, because, and again, uh, um, uh, I'm going back to this cutting edge styrofoam model, and here's the second half of it. Look at the shadow and the backdrop. On in both cases, on both photographs, there are dark features, or in case of the sun, light features, uh, that that can be called coronal loops. But in one case, they are well real in the sense that there are coherent, compact uh, magnetic flux tubes that brought them to existence. And in the second case, uh, there is an extended uh, veil-like structure that emits light, and it's the wrinkles in the structure that are responsible for bringing the loops into existence. This is pretty cool. Thank <laughs> like you. Th th this is super cool. Um, yeah, so with this, I guess, coronal veil hypothesis. Um, so if, if I'm if I'm understanding correctly, you know, basically we have, you know, material in, in our solar surface that is basically there's like wrinkles in these sheets, right? That's kind of potentially producing some of these structures. And, and and then I guess with the, the observer thing, it's all it could also just be a function of like how we're using our solar telescopes to to maybe look at some of this stuff too. Am I interpreting that right? Well, I mean, solar telescopes, they are essentially big gigantic cameras, very specialized cameras. And I mean, if, if I have a camera, then you know how uh, uh, what are the many ways in which I can use it? Well, uh, I mean, I, I point it and shoot it, right? Uh, it's, it, it is a question of how we interpret the observations and we might need to interpret them in a whole different way to understand what's going on. 
Great. Speaking of interpretation, I know you had uh, like a philosophical graphic. Do we want to talk about that now or did we want to take a, a question from the audience? Uh, are there questions from the audience? I'm happy to answer them. We, do, we did have one come in from Eric who is asking, why is the corona so much hotter than the solar surface? Uh, that, uh, or in other ways, uh, or in other words, what is the solar corona? Because it is indeed uh, many, many times hotter than the solar surface. This is an open question. And if you're interested in joining us in solar physics, this is still an, an open puzzle. Uh, there are different, uh, there are different models, but which of them, if any is correct, we do not know. But for sure, magnetic field is involved. For sure, magnetic reconnection is involved somehow. And that's about all I can say. So come study solar physics and find out. That's cool. Yeah, there's, there's definitely some uh, big questions out there that, that we're still trying to understand. Um, yeah, so go, going back to maybe this idea of, of observation and, and perspective, I, I know you have a, a, a fun kind of philosophical discussion <laughs> on science if we wanted to dive into that. Oh, sure. Yeah. Uh, and it has to do with that sun is very far away and it's very, very different from what, what we have experienced on Earth. So here's a bit of philosophy. Uh, imagine, uh, where is my PowerPoint slides? Oh, there we go. Imagine those two garments from Earth. And imagine those two aliens who have absolutely no idea of what these are and how we use them. Uh, those, those aliens will reconstruct an appearance of a human uh, in a way that resembles their own appearance. The point of this cartoon is our prior experience shapes our interpretation of what we experience right now. And we are, we earthlings are used a lot more to solid objects like bar magnets or like metal shavings. We are not used to anything like what we, um, what's going on in the sun. So we looked at the simulation, we found out that there are not many, well, garden hose like, so to speak, uh, compact magnetic flux tubes. So we found veils. Now what happens in the real active region? I mean, a model is a model, it has limitations. We think it's a pretty good model, but it's still just a model. So what happens in the sun? And that is an open question. Yeah, and I, I love this this discussion, right? That you know, even as as, sci as scientists, we're making all these observations, and we're we're, we're drawing our, our kind of past experiences to to help inter interpret some of these data. Um, great. So I don't see any, any any questions from the audience right now. So maybe we can move into um, one of our next poll questions. So as we kind of talk about the societal importance of of understanding, uh, you know, the structure of the solar atmosphere. Uh, maybe if we can show uh, show that that audience poll question that was asking, you know, what systems on Earth can be impacted by the sun's activity, and the the top answer I see there is, is our power grid. I think that's one that maybe many of us have had experience with. Um, you, you know, our, our power grid is being affected when there's a lot of solar activity going on. Um, the 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 tied for second, we had satellite communications as well as humans in space, such as in the International Space Station. And third uh, is crop yields. And then last was pigeon racing. <laughs> so did you have any uh, comments on any of those responses? Well, I, I, I have to say it was a lot of fun uh, coming up with those, uh, with those options. And coming up with the right answers was easy. It, it was difficult to come up with the wrong answer. And the wrong answer here by design is crop yields. All other answers are correct. Uh, and uh, our power grid uh, can have can suffer a severe impact uh, from a coronal mass ejection should it hit Earth. Oh, can you can you actually bl um, bring the slider questions back, please? Uh, yeah. So our power grid will have a severe impact uh, if if something arrives from the sun and we're not prepared. Well, uh, our satellite communications will be severely impacted also, and um, you know. Yes, that's kind of a common knowledge. And the energetic particles are obviously harmful for humans in space who do not have atmosphere to protect them. Now, here comes the fun part. Uh, it turns out that pigeons use Earth's magnetic field to navigate about. 
So people who handle pigeons professionally, they actually watch for geomagnetic indices because it is important for our birds orientation. And uh, live and learn, I learned my I, I, I learned about this myself this, just just this year. Now crop yields, uh, well, I mean, obviously, if we do not have a power grid, if we don't have you know our trucks that are filled with fuel and you know fertilizers and you know uh, and the information on how to fertilize the fields that would impact the crop yields, but this but this impact is not direct. And as for a direct impact, there is none that I'm aware of. There is not a physical mechanism that I'm aware of that would impact uh, the, the yield of the yield of wheat of the field. So that was a trick question. Yeah, uh, and uh, of course, of course, uh, here uh, here comes another caveat. Of course, if something happens with the sun, if if the sun gets a whole lot dimmer all of a sudden then that will impact crop yields. But this is not what happens in uh, extreme space weather events. What happens is that a lot of stuff suddenly hits the earth and impacts the earth magnetosphere and plays tricks with the earth magnetic field. And those things are relatively short lived. Yeah. Great, uh, I see a couple more questions that, that came in. Um, so one is from Brian, and I think it's maybe building on Eric's question previously about some things we don't, yeah, understand about about the sun, but maybe besides the solar veil, what other mysteries about the sun are you most interested in studying? Oh my God, uh, the coronal heating question for absolutely sure. And this is such a big topic because you, you think this is a small question, like let's just go and find a mechanism that heats the sun. No, it's, 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 like, it's like you open a Pandora box. Okay, magnetic field is responsible, responsible how, responsible in what ways? Uh, here's one way that can be responsible, and, and, then, and, then, and then there's a lot of research about this one way, and here's another way, and there's a lot of research in this other way, and, and how to find out which one is correct, and yeah, uh, that is an extremely important topic, and this is an extremely interesting topic for me personally. Uh, another topic that is interesting for me personally is how magnetic field structure is structured in the solar atmosphere. I did show you some magnetic field lines, and uh, most of them were uh, large, far away from the sun by design, so that you can see the solar curvature and all. Uh, but also, if you go further from the sun, those simple models are more correct. However, if you zoom into particular active regions, magnetic field lines twist and intertwine, and I'm, I'm very interested in how they're doing this and uh, how it evolves and what happens to magnetic flux tubes. I am also interested in what happens to the coronal mass ejections as they propagate. Do they do they squash and become like a jellyfish, for example? How does their inner structure change? And as they fly through the interplanetary magnetic field, it's, 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 it's one of the topics that we're currently investigating. As they travel through the interplanetary uh, media, it's, it's, uh, they, gather, they gather material like a snowplow effect. And uh, this this material, uh, we can actually absorb it, and it's very difficult to disentangle it from the coronal mass ejection itself. So uh, this uh, this topic is also a very interest, uh, very high interest to me. And then we have another question that came in from Melissa asking: uh, the the Parker Solar Probe was able to make contact with the corona. Were we able to get info from this encounter that we weren't able to observe before? Yes, uh, I must. Uh, I will. I will say a few words. However, I must say that this is not exactly my specialty. So I will. I will say what I do know, and what I do know is that uh, we got a few extremely high resolution images in the solar corona. That is one thing. Uh, the second thing is uh, we saw a lot of turbulence in the solar wind. So those are the two topics that I know off the top of my head. Great, um, and uh, we have a question here from Cherry, which I think also leads us, uh, it's, it's a great segue in, into our, our last question. Uh, Cherry's wondering, uh, what did you major in at university to get into solar physics? And, and building on that, uh, for, for our students in, in our virtual audience here, do you have any advice for them uh, for becoming uh, a solar physicist? I, I personally majored in physics. Some of my colleagues have majored in math, however, there are many different ways into solar physics, and some of my colleagues have majors in computer sciences. 
and they helped us build this data, this this data environment in which in which people like me thrive. So there are different ways into it, but it's basically physics math, uh, well, computer sciences, uh, sciences to come and help us build better, build better models, build better environments. Uh, engineers uh, help us build telescopes. So that is another area of study. That is another area that uh, kind of leads to solar physics eventually. And uh, what, uh, as as for the advice that I can that I can give, well, there are several. One is try to have fun as you as you major in whatever it is that you're majoring in. Look for puzzles. Look for questions. Look at how your professor solved those questions. Because once you become a researcher, there will be no answers that anybody knows. You will have to find answers. And try, uh, try and see if, if you're enjoying this or that. And I highly recommend the research experience for undergraduate pro uh, programs throughout the United States. And uh, last but not least, I have to say that if somebody tells you that you are not a, that you're not good enough because you're a woman or because you're I don't know Hispanic or because you have a disability, do not listen to them. You are absolutely good enough. The only qualifier is whether you like learning. If if you do enjoy learning, you are absolutely qualified. So, yeah. Definitely. Definitely, those are those are great words. I think I think to end on. So so Annie, thank you so much for being here today uh, to chat about uh, the sun and just the really really cool work that that you're you're doing here at NCAR. It is my pleasure. Thank you for having me here. And and definitely thank you to our team behind the scenes, Paul, Brett, and Aaliyah, uh, for supporting this conversation today. If you're interested in more NCAR Explorer series events, definitely check out our website for upcoming lectures and conversations, and also view recordings of past events. And so with that, I hope to see y'all next time, and I hope you have a great rest of your day.